Let us pray. God of justice, help us to see and understand your laws as you intend. Help us to be in relationship with our fellow man and woman. Keep us from the racism, bigotry, and fear that separates us as human beings. We are your creations. Each and every one of us, no matter how different we may appear, speak, or live. You have put us on this earth to live in relationship. Help us to learn how to do that peaceably before it's too late. We pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew 5 and goes all the way through chapter 7. And today, we come to the final two, you have heard it said, statements. And they're basically in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. But our opening paragraph today concerns the application of justice. And here, Jesus states the authentic standard of the law that the Pharisees and the scribes have undermined with deceitful interpretations for their own benefit. But Jesus restores the true intent of the law that has been perverted by these so-called religious authorities. Jesus states, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which is actually being quoted from Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25. And this is where a pregnant woman is injured by a bystander during an altercation. It's also found in Leviticus chapter 24, verses 17 through 21, which stipulates the degree of retaliation that is permitted when one individual suffers the loss of an animal or is harmed by another person. And again, in Deuteronomy chapter 19, 15 through 21, when one, when one who bears false witness against another does so with the intent to harm that person. Now, originally, believe it or not, these laws were, were was, to, was to prevent excessive punishment. In other words, you could only do to someone else in retaliation what they did to you. For all intent and purpose, it was to prevent you from killing others out of vengeance. And that's literally what these laws were referring to. So Jesus goes back to the original intent and says, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on your right cheek, give him the others also. And if anyone sues you and takes your coat, then give him your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go the second mile as well. Now that last one was a Roman rule where the Jews had to carry a Roman soldier's backpack for a mile. Couldn't do it for the second mile, only the first mile. But Jesus said, take it for the second mile. And in fact, this is why, if you remember the, the crucifixion story, the Roman soldier gets a gentleman to carry Jesus' cross because it was law and the rule. So Jesus is showing that the original intent of the law had more to do with your relationship with others than it did as some strict adherence to some rule that demanded tit for tat. And then, then Jesus takes it even further when he says, give to everyone who begs from you. Do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. And then he concludes the lesson by saying, final, it, it is final, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, I say love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. All of this, all of this is a direct reminder for us that true discipleship comes at a cost. And sometimes it's a pretty high personal cost. And Jesus' rationale is that God treats the righteous and the unrighteous the same. So why would we? Just like I explained to the children. Why would we treat them differently? Why is it that we only treat well 
those who treat us well. That's nothing special, as the scripture says. Even tax collectors love those who love them. And even the Gentiles greet their own kind politely. If we are followers of God and disciples of Jesus the Christ, then why wouldn't we be imitators of God and Jesus? Why wouldn't we strive to follow God's original intent? You see, the law of an eye for an eye and an eye for an eye was to keep people from killing each other, like I mentioned earlier. And God wanted some restraint when we're dealing with our fellow human beings. So that in the midst of disputes, in the midst of, the, of a dispute, the relationship was the important thing, as well as the justice. Relationship and justice come together. So how do we, how do we as a society meet, measure up today? How important is relationship to us? How important is it to us to find reconciliation over revenge or retaliation? Well, the answers to those questions are pretty easy if you really think about it. We don't do too well in reconciling our differences, if we're honest about that. In fact, we tend to go straight to retaliation or revenge rather than reconciliation in, in a lot of cases. How many times have you given someone the silent treatment? That's the easiest one. That's revenge. That's retaliation. Just give them the silent treatment. Or how about calling the police rather than going next door to your neighbor to tell them, please turn the music down? Or how about filing a lawsuit against your neighbor rather than just working it out? See, if, if we truly were different, there'd be no need for attorneys or courts. <laughs> We'd work out our differences because the relationship would be more important. And I'm sorry to say that it's not much different than we see in churches today either, believe it or not. Everyone wants the pastor to, sell, to settle the disputes. But when they don't agree with the pastor's methodology, they can all get mad and cause all sorts of chaos and some even leave the church. The relationship just isn't important. And that is what will determine whether a church survives a church fight. When the congregation believes that the relationship is more important, that's when everyone pulls together and finds the solution and makes it work. And that's exactly what we saw happen in this church over the dispute of a fellowship time. Look at it now. There's plenty of food, there's little excess, and there's healthy choices. The financial burden is now spread over more people, and we even have a coordinator to help us out. This church believed that the relationship was too important, and that the relationship with each other and the relationship with our visitors was important than to be allowed to suffer over a simple disagreement and a misunderstanding. This is also why we hear from our visitors that they feel so welcome. Because this church believes that a relationship, even with a stranger, is so, so worthwhile. That a relationship of solidarity with the marginalized and the outcast and the disenfranchised is so worthwhile of a mission to support. And because these relationships benefit the members of this congregation as people of God and as disciples of Christ proclaiming the good news. Talk about putting God's work into action. If relationship was deemed to be important in our world, can you imagine the changes we'd see? I mean, think about it. Marriage would not be a 50-50 proposition. Poverty would be a thing of the past. Welfare would be no more. Wars would be gone. There'd be no racism or protest for simple human rights. The only thing that would matter would be the relationship you have with others. So, may we continue to be in relationship with those we deem good as well as those that we deem bad because God loves both the righteous and the unrighteous. In some days, it's hard to tell which side we fall on. Amen. Mm -hmm.